Okay, so our speaker today is Michel Vandenberg. He got his PhD in 1985 under the supervision of Frendi Vai Oestein and Jan van Gill. And he had a distinguished career holding positions at MIT, Antwerp, Strasbourg, and the Flanders Scientific Foundation, FWO, where he is currently a director of research based at Hasselt University and the Free University of Brussels. He has dealt fundamental work in several areas, including non-commutative geometry, a direction that can be described as the use of non-commutative algebraic structures to model geometric objects. Professor Vandenberg has addressed the International Congress in 1994, and today he will give a plenary talk on non-commutative resolution of coercion singularities and SKMS. Please. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the International Mathematical Union for inviting me to give this talk here. It's a great honor. I would also like to thank the organizers of this conference here for allowing me to, to give the talk live after the, uh, as we all know, the con conference in St. Petersburg had to be canceled because of the sad events in Ukraine. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'm going to start with a little bit of motivation. So uh, many, many uh, mathematical problems can be translated into group actions and understanding orbits for a group. So we all know the Rubik's cube. And an obvious question is, if we take the Rubik's cube apart and randomly reassemble it, will we be able to solve it? So this can be translated into a, a problem of an action of a group. So we have a, a set, which is all the ways of assembling the cube. And we have a group, which is generated by the operations we can do on the cube. Now it turns out that the set of orbits for this group action has order 12. So the answer to the question is no. So the answer to the question is no. And in fact, you, the, the probability of being able to do it would be one over 12. Now, uh, in algebraic geometry, we study moduli problems. So moduli problems are about, also about classifying things like vector bundles on curves, or maybe the curves themselves. And the traditional approach to moduli problems is to translate them into understanding the orbits of a, the action, for the action of a group on a certain space. Now, uh, there is a serious problem one encounters is that even if we look at orbits on a smooth space, then the, um, the orbits of points which have a non-trivial stabilizer will usually give rise to singularities in the orbit space. So I give a, a very simple example. So consider the, the group of two elements acting on the complex affine plane, sending every point to, a, to its opposite point, then uh, I've written down what the orbit space is. And to establish that this is really the orbit space, you have to construct a map which separates the orbits and which did, that I have also done. Now the equations aren't so important, well, except for the last claim, one can check that the, um, the orbit space is, is smooth everywhere except in the one point which has a non-trivial stabilizer. So here's a picture. Now the orbit space is, is um, four-dimensional, uh, complex dimension two, so that's too big to visualize. So what I've done here is made a picture of the real points, but you can still see that the origin is, behaves differently from the other points. So it's a singular point. Now in algebraic geometry, and Sasha's already mentioned this, we can resolve such singularities by a procedure called blowing up. And on the right-hand side, we see what happens if we do this. And it, uh, well, the right-hand side picture looks very smooth. And it, one also has the impression that the point has been replaced by a circle, but that's misleading because we, all, we only have the real points in the picture. So what actually happens is that the singular point is replaced by a complex line. 
Okay, now I'm going to discuss a very classical example of a group action. So the uh, McKay correspondence, which is concerned with finite subgroups of the special linear group. So the special linear group is the group of matrices of determinant one. And the finite subgroups, they come in five families, of which the last three families only contain one group. Now the, the last three groups, which are called the exceptional groups in this context, if you divide out their center, they're precisely the symmetry groups of the uh, uh, platonic solids. And the platonic solids, as the name says, they're very classical objects. They were known to the ancient Greeks. This picture is actually from a book from 1596 by Johannes Kepler, where he uh, introduced the music of spheres, which is some relation of the uh, conjectured relation by him of the platonic solids and the uh, planets which, which were known at that time. Okay, so as, so as I said, we're talking about finite subgroups of the special linear group. And uh, such a group acts tot tautologically on, on the complex plane. Then uh, we can construct the orbit space. And again, as in our example, it is singular except for one point, the origin. And algebraic geometry allows us to resolve that singularity. Then uh, we can see what we've actually done to the singular point. So in the example, the singular point became a projective line. Now here, in general, something a bit more complicated happens. What we get is a, a tree of projective lines and the incidence graph of these projective lines is, uh, has a very particular form. It's a member of a famous list of graphs, the so-called Dinkin diagrams. And if you look at D, the D cases and the E cases, then we see that there's a unique central vertex and then there are three arms emanating from it. And the, the length of those arms, they correspond to the exponents in the presentation of the group. So that's the connection. Um, so to give, uh, if what I said wasn't clear enough, so here is a, an example. Consider the binary dihedral group of order eight. So as a subgroup of SL2, this is generated by those two elements. One can compute the orbit space. Uh, I, I'll, Will not explain this and then one can look at the inverse image of the uh, singular point and you get a, a tree so a central p1 and then two, three transversal p1s and the incidence graph is d4 so that's how it looks now if we have a a group then we can consider its representations so a representation of a group is a vector space on which the group acts linearly and um, an irreducible representation is sort of a minimal representation, a representation that doesn't have any sub-representations, non-trivial sub-representations. So I said G acts on, the, on C2, tautologically. So that's a representation of G for a finite subgroup of SL2. And we can then uh, say that two rep irreducible representations are connected if, if they are satisfied the relation I wrote there. And um, one can check that this relation is actually symmetric. So now we have a, a finite set and a symmetric relation. So then we can make a graph. And again, the, the graphs one gets are very particular. They're so-called extended Dinkin diagrams. Uh, so the list is, is on, I've, I've pictured the list of those extended Dinkin diagrams. I've written on the vertices, the dimensions of the irreducible representations. And you see also see that there's a green vertex where the number is one. And this corresponds to the so-called trivial representation. So the trivial representation is the one dimensional vector space on which the group acts trivially. If I take away this, trivial representation, then what's left is an ordinary Dinkin diagram. Okay, so I've written the setting again so that you remember. Now, uh, 
One version of the McKay correspondence says that the two graphs we constructed, so the incidence graph of the exceptional locus and the McKay graph of the non-trivial reducible representations, that they're both the same graphs. And moreover, as already said, this graph is a Dinkin diagram. So this, uh, this has a long history and I've written some of the names that are associated to it. Okay, um, so the McKay correspondence is kind of nice, but it also looks a bit ad hoc. And what I would now to discuss is a, uh, a much more general result that um, by Caprano and Vassuro, that first of all implies the classical McKay correspondence, but that also shows how you could, how one should try to generalize it. And then, yeah, I need to derive, discuss the derived category of coherent sheaf. So Sasha already did this beautifully in this last talk. So there will be uh, some duplication. Uh, so, okay. So we're basically talking elementary algebraic geometry. So the, uh, in algebraic geometry, when it starts with something called an affine scheme, and what is an affine scheme? It's associated to a commutative ring. I will not say what it is, but it's some sort of space whose ring of functions is, gives you back the ring you started from. Now, we will only be concerned with finitely generated rings. And then the associated space is just the solutions of the equations. Of course, this is not entirely accurate, but it will do. So this will be called an affine algebraic variety instead of an affine scheme, an algebraic variety, because it's this particular form, and we will only consider those. Then an, a general algebraic variety is something which is covered by affine algebraic varieties. And so the, the projective line, which is just the complex plane plus one point at infinity, this can be covered by two affine uh, opens, one the neighborhood of zero and one the neighborhood at infinity. And then uh, one can try to compute the functions on the projective line. So the way to do this is to, uh, to look at the affine parts. And there we know what the functions are almost by definition, and they should coincide on the intersection. So this is a, a pleasant little exercise. And then you find that the only functions that exist are the constant functions. So in contrast to affine spaces, uh, the projective line doesn't have enough global functions to uh, describe the geometry. Now, uh, this problem also occurs in other uh, parts of mathematics, also in complex geometry. So to solve this, one should not only work with rings, with, with the chiefs. So basically for every affine open, we remember the functions there. And we also remember if we have an inclusion of affine opens, what the restriction map is. And then of course this should be uh, there should be some compatibility for, for double intersections. So an, an, an algebraic variety, we can define coherent sheaves. On an affine algebraic variety, this is just the module category. For, uh, for general algebraic variety, we have to do it by some gluing procedure. So, and then uh, for the projective line, um, so to define a coherent sheaf on the projective line, we have to say whether it is on the two affine opens, and we have to say how they match up on the intersection. And this is captured by phi, which I've written there. And then, uh, so the, one can then look at the case where on the affine opens, one does nothing, but then one still has some freedom in the gluing. And then we get the tautological line bundles, which already occurred in Sasha's talk. Now, uh, abelian categories are often too rigid. So an abelian category is a category in which every morphism has a kernel and a co-kernel, and this should satisfy some axiom, some well-known axiom. So an abelian category is just like the category of abelian groups, and this is probably why it's, it's been named like that. Um, now we will consider 
derived categories. So to give a little bit of uh, motivation, so in, in algebraic topology, one, one considered spaces up to homotopy equivalence or weak homotopy equivalence. And one way to do this is basically to formally invert uh, weak homotopy equivalences, which are maps which induce uh, isomorphisms on homotopy groups. Now for the derived category, we just translate this. So uh, instead of spaces, we, we work with complexes over an abelian category and Sasha has defined what a complex is. And then the homotopy groups are replaced by a cohomology. And then uh, we formally invert morphisms which induce isomorphisms on cohomology. And also, as Sasha was saying, uh, we will be mostly interested in, in um, a subcategory of the full derived category, namely with the objects which have zero cohomology and low and high degree. Now, the derived category is not abelian. Um, so the category of complexes is abelian, but uh, kernels and co-kernels do not survive uh, this inverting of quasi-isomorphism. But there are some uh, operations that do survive, and they actually also come from algebraic topology. So there is something called suspension, so an operation in algebraic topology, which here just amounts to shifting the complex and there's also an operation called mapping cone. I mean, I've written how it's defined. And uh, with suspension and mapping cone, we can define something which in algebraic topology would be called the cofiber sequence. And here it's called a distinguished triangle. As I already said, derived categories are not abelian. They're examples of triangulated categories. So, uh, so a tri triangulated category is an additive category. So basically this means that the home space is an additive and some additional property. And they have an auto equivalence, suspension, and a collection of distinguished triangles. And they have to satisfy four axioms, which following Sasha, I will not say what they are. The last one is particularly complicated. Um, so, and what categories will we be considering? Well, for an algebraic variety, we consider the band of derived category of coherent sheaves. For a ring, we consider the band of derived category of finitely generated R modules. And um, now, if R is non commutative, and this will happen uh, later in the talk, then we have to specify left or right modules. So, I always mean left modules. And then the point is there are uh, many non-obvious equivalences between such derived categories, many more than there are on the level of sheaves. So here, and this is an example that Sasha also mentioned, if we take, for example, P1, then its derived category is uh, equivalent to the bounded derived category, what's called the chronic equivalent for people that know. So formally, it's diagrams of this form. and um, so it basically says that the, uh, the geometric object, homologically, it's, it can be described by very interesting and potentially easier linear algebra. Okay, so now we'll go back to the McKay correspondence. So this reminder, this is the setting. Uh, this is what the classical McKay correspondence says, two graphs are the same. And then what Caprano and Vassero did is they showed that this correspondence is actually a consequence of a much more powerful result, which can be formulated as an equivalence of, of categories. And to state this, I have to introduce an uncommutative ring. So this is the cross product. And I mean, I, I will not read the definition. I mean, it's, it's written there. I hope it's uh, understandable. So it's, it's something, it's the cross product which sort of mixes the functions and the group. If we have a representation of the group, we can make it a module over the cross product in the way that's written there. 
And um, then Kapralov and Vassarov, they show that the derived category of this non-commutative ring, this cross product, is the same as the derived category of the minimal resolution of the orbit space. And uh, moreover, if, if we look at the irreducible representations, which are not trivial, they then correspond in, in a way that's written there to uh, projective lines in the exceptional locus. And this correspondence is, is actually rec precisely recovers the classical McKay correspondence. Now, it's obvious that this result immediately, one immediately asks, uh, how does this generalize? I mean, so here there's some, uh, some things. So for SL3, there's a very deep result uh, by Bridgman, King and Reed. He says that it also works for SL3, but it's really a deep, no, difficult result. Then, uh, having this result, this derived McKay correspondence for SL3, one can try to go back and, um, and, and what does it tell me about representations? And this was uh, done uh, by Kotis, Kroh, and Logvinenko, and actually they did it in the Abelian case as far. Uh, yeah, so it's not as general as I write it there, but... Um, now, for higher SLN, things become more complicated because recall in the McKay correspondence, there are two ingredients. There is the cross product, which always exists, but then there's also a resolution. And actually, I haven't said this, but this resolution needs to be fairly small. It needs to satisfy a technical condition called crepent. I will not say what it is. I mean, uh, algebraic geometers, of course, no. So, and this such a crepent resolution doesn't all, doesn't have to exist when n is four or higher. But if it does exist, then it's conjectured that we have the derived McKay correspondence. Now, this is wide open, except in two cases. So, there is the case of abelian groups, and this was done by Kawamata. Abelian groups is always easier because then the quotient is toric, and one can use toric geometry. And then the case where G is actually contained in a subgroup of a cell, the special linear group in the symplectic group. This was done by Bezrikovnik and Kaledin. And again, there are some, there are some extra feature. One can use deformation theory and reduction to finite characteristic. There's some extra features which are not available in the general case. Okay. So uh, this was the finite groups. Now we can ask, uh, what about infinite groups? Well, now, first of all, a finite group is a, I mean, is a discrete group. It's a, as a geometric object, it's just a finite number of points. Now in algebraic geometry, you cannot work with infinite uh, discrete groups. Algebraic geometry is not equipped for that. So we should consider algebraic groups and groups which are algebraic varieties. And here are some examples. We already met this, um, the uh, special linear group. And I've also written the general linear group and then the orthogonal group. Um, okay, so we had uh, orbit spaces several times. Now, how do we actually construct an orbit space for a finite group? Well, Basically, we take the ring of invariant functions and then we take the spectrum of that. And if you would go back and look at the examples I did, then this is precisely what I actually did. I took the invariant functions and, and used these. And, and it seems that this like, like makes perfect sense for infinite groups, right? I mean, this definition. Now, this is in some sense true, but there are some issues. First of all, if G is in a, an algebraic group, then the invariant ring may not be finitely generated. So we have to restrict the algebraic groups we use, and they're so-called reductive groups. And there are many definitions of reductive groups. So one of them is, for example, that the category of representation should be semi-simple. More interestingly, maybe, is to see an example of a non-reductive group, the additive group of the complexes is non reductive. Um, 
okay, suppose G is reductive, then we still have a problem. If we define uh, Z over G with the formula on the second line, we will in, not, in general, not get an orbit space. So the notation would be confusing. So instead of a slash, we use a double slash to indicate that it's not an orbit space, but we will still think of it as a quotient. So in the, in the sequel, I will talk about the quotient of G by G when I actually mean this double slash construction. Now this, uh, this quotient Z double slash G does not uh, parameterize orbits, but it parameters, parameterizes closed orbits. And so what goes wrong is that if I have an algebraic group acting on a variety, then there may, may be non-closed orbits. And if you think of it, well, fibers need to be closed. So uh, non-closed orbits can never occur in an orbit space. So um, that's, why, that's why we have a problem. Okay, let's now uh, discuss the simplest possible reductive algebraic group. And I, I'm, so this would be the multiplicative group of the complexes. With, with, of course, we have to omit zero. And uh, I'm, I argue that this group, if it's an infinite group, but this is actually even simpler than a finite group. And uh, we'll see why that is later. Now, assume this group acts on uh, complex four space in the way that's written there. Then we can construct the quotient. And now we know how to do it. We just should look at the invariant functions, and there are four invariant functions that generate all invariant functions. Um, so this gives us the quotient space, and these four functions actually satisfy uh, this, quadratic, this quadratic relation, ux is vw. This quotient, again, is everywhere smooth except in one point, the origin. If we take the inverse image of the origin in Z, then we see that it uh, falls apart in two par parts. And I'll, I'll say something about this later. But what's important is, and this illustrates what I said before, the inverse image of the origin is not a T orbit. So this quotient is not an orbit space. This quotient is known uh, to physicists as the conifold, uh, well, in some sense, it's the, the singularity of the quotient. It's not a finite quotient singularity, but in some sense, it's the simplest possible singularity, which is like that. Um, so here is what I said on the previous slide once again, but now with a picture. So we have the quotient map and we have the inverse image of the origin, which consists of two parts. Now, recall that in the finite group case, we now uh, took a resolution of the quotient. So, I mean, we should do that here, but it turns out that the, the, the minimal resolutions are now no longer unique. This is a feature of birational geometry in higher dimension. So there are actually two of them. And the way to get them is by uh, taking out one of the parts of this, uh, uh, this inverse image of the origin. So I call this, or they are called unstable parts. And then the complement, what remains, is called the semi-stable part. And it turns out that these actually give you resolutions. So I've written it in the last item. I take Z and for example, I take out N plus, this gives me Z SS plus. And on that part, T actually acts freely. So there is an honest orbit space which exists algebraically. And then if I take the orbit, the orbit space, I get a resolution. So this is the picture. So we have the quotient um, and then two resolutions. Now, this configuration of spaces is very classical. It's called the Athea flop. Now, at the, uh, flops, they're, they're, this is a general uh, concept. It's some kind of uh, algebraic surgery. 
And there is a, a famous conjecture made, as far as I know, independently by Bondal and Orloff and Bakala Mata, which says that flops uh, always induce derived equivalences. Uh, this conjecture is wide open, but in this particular example, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting exercise and one can fairly easily verify it directly. Okay, so we have our resolutions. Now, question is, can we also find kind of a non-commutative ring which plays the role of the cross product? Now, if you haven't been able, been paying attention, maybe you think we can do the same thing, just take the cross product with the torus, but this would be a very bad idea because the um, T is uncountable as an abstract group. So that would be much, much too big. So uh, what we need is something, the new concept, well, new, I mean, so it's covariant. So covariants are actually pre-Hilbert in, invariant theory, but uh, the modern interpretation is like follow, is as follows. If we have a group acting on a variety and the representation, then we can look at the, um, uh, the functions, from the variety to the representation, which are equivariant for the group. And uh, we will use this actually in a specific case, namely, if we have a representation, if we take the endomorphisms, that's of course a finite dimensional algebra. And if I then take the uh, covariance, that actually gives me an algebra. So I call this an algebra of covariance. And then um, if I have a finite group, and if I take the direct sum of all distinct irreducible representations, then the lambda u, this algebra of covariance, it's not exactly the cross product, but it has the same module category. So this is just as good. And again, now we have something that, uh, makes sense if g is not finite so the, i mean if you go back at the definition not, uh, nothing here requires that g is finite the only issue is that we cannot take the sum of all irreducible representations because there would be infinitely many for an infinite group so we get something which is much too big and which would be the wrong thing anyway Okay, let's go back to the conifold um, example. So recall this was about the one dimensional algebraic torus. And I said, this is a very simple group. And, uh, and this you can see from its representation theory. So first of all, it's of course reductive. So this means every representation is a sum of irreducible representations. And the irreducible representations, they are all one dimensional and they are indexed by the integers. So the precise definition is written there. Now, if I take uh, L0 and L1, and then I take the algebra of covariance, then one may show that one indeed has a, a derived equivalence as in the uh, classical McKay, or classical derived McKay correspondence. So, I'm, I'm giving back the picture of the two resolutions. Now we have something, a third object, and I put this in the middle for some reason, because it turns out that the bondal orloff equivalence, which I gave a couple of slides earlier, actually, the easiest way to see it is to factor it through this lambda. And uh, I, I think of this lambda actually as a... Uh, a third resolution, namely a non-commutative one. And actually a non-commutative crepent resolution because it satisfy the analog of crepentness in commutative algebraic geometry. But again, I will not precisely say what I mean by this. Uh, okay, so now we may ask, um, well, how general is this? Is this uh, so uh, with my longtime quarter, Shvela Shvenko, we, we looked for such the construction of such non-commutative crepent resolution of quotient spaces. 
And we were able to prove that they exist in many cases. And this required um, some homological algebra, which luckily uh, I had developed earlier. And I reported on this in my ICM talk in 1994, the algebra section. So in some sense, this talk is a sequel to that talk. Um, uh, so the non-commutative resolutions often exist when there is no nice commutative resolution. For people that know geometric invariant theory, to, to construct this nice commutative resolutions, your group needs to have at least a character. And the theory we used actually doesn't require the existence of any character. So it's, uh, it is a strictly more general. Then, um, so I thought Sasha would have mentioned homological projective duality, which he didn't. Uh, so these non-commutative, um, so, uh, so as Sasha made clear is that often you need to replace um, uh, commutative varieties by slightly non-commutative ones to have better behavior. And um, so he developed this theory of homological projective duality where, where this is an important feature. And there, there was some conjecture of the existence of certain uh, HPD for certain natural quotients of orthogonal and symplectic groups. So this was in some sense conjectured by mathematical physicist Hori, and then made formal by Sasha. And using these non-commutative resolutions, we constructed Renamo and Siegel uh, were able to prove this. And then I should say, uh, to give credit, before we did this, Broom had already done, uh, established the existence of NCCRs for three-dimensional toric singularities using the theory of diamond models. And this actually theory is a bit independent of, of ours, so it's not, a, it's not a consequence. Okay. Um, so before I just told you that we had this nice derived equivalence, uh, a non-commutative ring being um, derived equivalent to a resolution of a quotient singularity, but I didn't tell you what the equivalence was. So again, you can construct the equivalence directly. It's not that hard, but it's actually better to think of it from the point of windows and the Concept of windows, I will now explain, is sort of a, a sort of classical version by Donovan and Segal. And I should say that nowadays they're kind of more sophisticated versions by Happel Leisner and some, and also by uh, Balar Favero Kazakov. But the version of Donovan and Segal is perfect for what I need. So to, to, to explain this, I need to introduce the concept of quotient stack. So I told you that if I have a group acting on a variety, then usually the orbit space does not exist. Now, mathematicians are very stubborn. So if something does not exist, they make it exist. And this is actually what the quotient stack is. It's sort of a, an object, which is not so easy to define, but which behaves like a quotient stack, even if the quotient stack does not exist as a scheme. Now we do not know, have to know the construction. We only have to know that it has a category of coherent sheaves. And this is just the category of G equivariant coherent sheaves. If I then have a representation, then I can look at the uh, subcategory generated by uh, a specific object, specific G equivariant object, namely, so the representation is U, then I should take U tensor the structure sheaf. This is a G equivariant object. And then generated basically means that we take the smallest triangulated subcategory, which contains this object and which is also close to the direct summons. And then it's an elementary verification that we have the equivalence in the last line. And then, uh, 
so to, to continue, it will be fruitful to think of, instead of the derived category of this non-cumulative ring to think of the derived category of this window category. So uh, then we need to explain the derived equivalence or the equivalence of the window category with the derived category of the resolution. And um, so this is written there. So we have Z. And inside Z, we have, we have semi-stable parts. So we have two, two ways of selecting this, plus or minus. And uh, this means if I have a complex of coherent sheaves on Z, I can restrict it. And I can, of course, do the same with T equivariant, a complex of T equivariant coherent sheaves. So that's the middle map. Then, uh, by definition, the window category is contained in the derived category of the stack. So that's the left arrow. And then I told you before that the, uh, these semi-stable parts, there the action is free. So there is an honest orbit space. So we don't actually need the stack. So that explains the last equality. OK. So this was for L0 and L1, but there's nothing special about L0 and L1. We can also do this for any two consecutive representations. So I told you they were indexed by the integers. So for any sign and for any N, I get an equivalence like this. Moreover, uh, if I have a T equivariant complex and I tensor with L1, it's still T equivariant. So this gives me an auto equivalence of the stack. And this restricts to the window categories, but it shifts them by one degree. So uh, Donovan and Segal call this a window shift. So uh, now we have many toys. We can compose these things in all kinds of ways. And we may wonder how should we think about this? Well, it turns out there is a very convenient way of thinking about this. And this is by using a um, local system of categories. OK. Uh, so if it, let me first remind you what is a local system. If we have a topological space, then a local system on M is just a locally constant sheaf of vector spaces on M. Uh, one iconic way to get those is to look at solutions of linear differential equations. So usually the um, solutions of linear differential equations, they are multi-valued. So they, they don't exist as genuine functions, but they exist locally. And, and, and using this, you can, you can uh, yeah, you can turn them into a local system. It's also a classical fact that local systems is exactly the same as representations of the fundamental group. And then as always with chief theoretic constructions, one doesn't have to specify uh, a local system for every open. We can specify it for a convenient cover. And, uh, and it's even convenient to to take a cover by simply connected things because local systems on a simply connected space is just the same as vector spaces. Okay, uh, so instead of local system of vector spaces, we can also easily talk about local systems of categories. So I made a diagram here. So the blue and the green, uh, okay, first of all, I should, should say, what is my space? The space is the complement of the integers in the complexes. Now, my picture wouldn't look very nice if I really tried to cover that space by opens. So I, I made a little bit of room around the points I leave out, but topologically, that doesn't make any difference. So you get the same category of local systems. So then um, the blue and the green uh, open sets. So this, this is a representation of a cover. The blue, on the blue and the green open sets, I put the derived category of the resolutions. And then between the integers, I put the window categories. So I'm saying the non-cumulative resolutions. And then, um, 
So to go from one open to another, I have the gluing, and this gluing is precisely given by the equivalences I gave on the, pri on the previous slide. Maybe I should go back to, right? We had the phis. Uh, they give you the, uh, the gluing between the window categories and the uh, commutative, commutative categories. And as I said, there's also the Z action which acts by translation. Now, if we forget about the Z action, then uh, if I take a base point, say in the blue area, then I, I get an action of pi one of the complement of the integers on the derived category of the resolution. Now, um, this is not quite right because it forgets an important feature of the situation, which is the Z action. So if, if to take this properly into account, uh, then we get a action of pi one of this space, the complement of Z divided by Z. Now, what is this space? Well, it's easy to see that it's actually the a sphere minus three points. So, so basically we, had, we get this sphere by minus three points by rolling up this picture. And then sort of uh, pictorially, you can think of it have, having like three continents. So near the poles, you have sort of commutative continents. I mean, where the commutative resolutions live and near the equator, we have the non-commutative resolution. Now, um, I'm lying a little bit because a triangulated category doesn't know about commutative and non-commutative. So to make this formal, we, we need some additional data and this is called a T-structure. So I will not say what it is but I'll, I'll come back to it uh, a bit later. Okay, so I, I think this for a mathematician is kind of a nice picture. Now for physicists, I mean, it's uh, not at all surprising because for them it follows from something called mirror symmetry. And uh, so Mirror symmetry is, a, is kind of a physical theory, but it has some mathematical interpretations. And one of them is homological mirror symmetry due to Maxim Kensevitz. And now I'm gonna give, and I'm a bit embarrassed in front of the audience here, but I'm gonna give an, uh, an uh, extremely sketchy account of this. So if we, I mean, mirror symmetry of homological mirror symmetry is about a relationship between complex and symplectic geometry. So if we have a complex variety, then a homological mirror partner is a symplectic variety such that we have the derived category coherent sheaf should be then the, the Fukaya category of the mirror dual. And um, so the Fukaya category is some kind of triangulated category, which is built up from Lagrangians. Um, so I know this picture is, is extremely sketchy and that would require much, much more in detail to uh, even attempt to explain it a bit better. But I mean, this is the idea. Now, the idea is that symplectic varieties are kind of locally trivial. I mean, stable on the deformation so, I mean, if they're compact, this is a result of Moses' dilemma, but even if this does not apply, then, I mean, it's kind of a general principle. Uh, I mean, it's obviously false because you can make random holes. I mean, and then it wouldn't be true, but okay, philosophically it's true. And, uh, and this, this means if we have a family of symplectic varieties and then, yeah, if it's nice enough, it will be, locally trivial, and then we can get an action of the uh, by parallel transport on the uh, Fukaya category, uh, by parallel of the fundamental group of the base on the Fukaya category of the fiber. So more precisely, I, I tried to sketch this, so we had a loop in the base. So by some kind of parallel transport, this becomes a path in the family, and then uh, this define some kind of action, I mean, of the fundamental group of the base on the fiber, and then by some kind of appropriate uh, functoriality, this should then give an action on the Fukaya category. And physicists even tell us uh, informally what we should take. 
It should be the moduli space of complex structures on the mirror dual, and they call this the string tree Kähler moduli space. Okay. Uh, so if all this works, we get an action of pi one of the SKMS on the Fukaya category. And then uh, recall we have homological mirror symmetry, which says that the Fukaya category of the mirror partner is the derived category of the original uh, variety. Okay, so th this is the end result. This is predicted by homological mirror symmetry. And if we now look, then we see we actually ended up with a purely algebraic statement. If there's some oracle that tells us what the SKMS is, some physicist that tells us what it is for some physical reason, then we have a, a something we can check. So this is an observation that has been made by many people independently, and I've some written some names of people I, I, I remember talking about this. So let's call it the SKMS conjecture. So this is my terminology, I mean, just for this talk, to be able to talk about this. Okay, so let's go back to our example. And I put the setting again, always the same setting. Now, um, in this case, uh, physicists tell us what the, the mirror is uh, of the resolution. So it's actually a Lando Ginzburg model. So um, this is, so as a symplectic variety, it's quite trivial, it's just a three dimensional torus with some standard symplectic form, but we have to equip it with an extra function which somehow affects this Fukaya category. Anyway, uh, I will not say more about this, but the potential is, is a Laurent polynomial so uh, it's written there and it has four generic coefficients. Now the idea is that we have to make a family and uh, here actually we, the family we should make should actually change the potential, but it changes it in such a way that the topology doesn't change. So, uh, and one way to look at the topology is to, uh, to look at the critical locus, I mean, the, uh, the points where the derivatives are uh, all together are zero. And this turns out to be a nice hypersurface in the coefficients. And this then tells us what the SKMS is. We, the SKMS is the space of coefficients where, which are not on this hypersurface where something special happens. And there's a huge group, well, there's a, big group acting on this, which is a rescaling group. If we rescale the variables x, y, and z, we can compensate for this by rescaling the coefficients. So we should uh, remove this. And then we get c star minus one, which is again, the sphere minus three points. So basically, uh, what, uh, what I explained earlier in a, in a bit of an ad hoc way, is actually a proof of the SKMS conjecture for the resolution of the conifold. Uh, okay, let me just say that um, this picture I explained for the conifold act uh, applies to, uh, it's a bit technical, applies to actions of tori. Uh, again, we have a Hori Vafa mirror. And again, we get an SKMS, which uh, is the complement of a, uh, a hypersurface up to some rescaling. And it's actually formally, it lives in the dual torus. And maybe this hypersurface uh, is a very classical object. It's called the principal A determinant. And this was introduced by Gelfin, Kapranov and Zelovinsky in their uh, famous book discriminants, resultants, and multidimensional determinants. Now, um, with uh, Spela, we when we looked into this in the, our study of non-commutative resolution, we came across a condition which, which should be called quasi-symmetry, which basically says, so in the first line, we say that we start from some weights 
that the uh, if we take an arbitrary line through the origin, the sum of all weights is zero. And then later, uh, Kite, a student of Siegel, actually proved that under this condition, which we found sort of in a, in yeah, we needed it for our investigations, that this is actually as an important fundamental consequence. In that case, the SKMS, which was written on the uh, first display, is actually the complement of a toric hyperplane arrangement in the dual torus. Um, now, if we have a um, if we have a, uh, a hyperplane arrangement, there are good ways of describing the fundamental group. So the, the first problem in the SKMS conjecture is to actually describe the fundamental group. This is not easy. But in this case, for a hyperplane arrangement, there are standard description. So, and then uh, this allowed Halper, Leisner, and Sam to uh, prove the SKMS conjecture for uh, quasi-symmetric quotients for tori, and also for uh, quotients of quasi-symmetric representations for more general groups with some restrictions. And basically they, they, they developed the methods we had uh, developed further. Uh, in the non-quasi-symmetric case, this is uh, wide open. And uh, so there's some examples have been done by Kite in his PhD thesis from um, a very important, if we go away from quotient singularities, a very important case uh, which has been done is the group by, by people working with Michael Weem. So I've written some names uh, there, it is known. Um, something I know less well, but in representation theory, there are also cases and then I put some dots because no doubt I'm forgetting to mention things. But as I said, in general, it's wide open. Okay. Um, then uh, to conclude, some odds and ends. Um, the non commutative resolutions I mentioned, they were ring theoretical because originally I'm an algebraist, so I liked rings. But as we heard in last talk, I mean, there also a concept of categorical resolutions, which uh, is potentially more general. And yeah, it depends on the context, what you would prefer to use. Um, I said that these structures are very important. And actually there's a beautiful theory of modelized space of stability conditions. So stability conditions are these structures with extra data. And there is a, a conjectural relation between the SKMS and the modelized space of stability conditions, which you can sort of expect. Um, if one has a local system of categories on a, on a space, one can try to extend it to a compactification. And this leads then to the theory of Schober's by Kapranov and Chechman. And Schober's are categorical analogs of perverse sheets. And uh, so they're currently only defined for complement of hyperplane arrangements. So this is exactly the context of quasi-symmetric quotient varieties. So we were able to construct Schober's in that setting. And then finally, uh, if we have a local system of categories, we can of course apply all kinds of functors to it. So one kind of one functor one can apply is to take the, the complexified Groton D group. So this gives me an honest local system. And I told you that one way to produce local systems is by solutions of differential equations. So you can ask, is there maybe a nice system of differential equations that gives me this local system? And for the conifold, this is the classical hypergeometric equation. One can check this. And for toric quotient in general, there's a conjecture what it is, and uh, it's called the GKZ system, also introduced by these people, Kelvin, Kaprano, and Zelewinski. And this was proved by Schrenko and me in the quasi symmetric case. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Michelle, for your very exciting talk. The questions can be done through the Discord server, so I don't have access to it. Thank you once again.